Hey everybody, welcome to episode number two in the series on this 1950s Gibson Les Paul Jr. that I found in Wichita, Kansas in the worst condition I've ever seen. I brought it home, plugged it in, and it sounded absolutely remarkable. So you can check out the original video here on YouTube, and many of you did, and you guys made it go absolutely viral, so thank you for that. If you enjoy these kinds of videos and wanna support what I do here on YouTube, please consider subscribing to the YouTube channel and checking out some of my other content here. You can also listen to my new record. It's available anywhere to stream for free. All of these things will help me continue to find these cool guitars, tell their stories, and create music with them. So today we're gonna be trying to authenticate and verify this guitar. Unfortunately, the original inked on serial number has flaked away. So our only hope is to find the original pot codes and hopefully that'll tell us the date of manufacture. We will also get a reading on the original P90 with a multimeter. I've got some digital calipers here that we can take measurements of the neck shape on this one. Um, and just check out all the features and try to uncover some of the history of this 1950s Les Paul Jr. Uh, let's go ahead and take a look at the finish on this guitar. I wanna give you guys some close-ups because I did not really get to do that in the last video. Back in the 1950s, this would have been finished in a tobacco sunburst on the front and kind of a dark mahogany back and neck. It also had a Brazilian rosewood fretboard that was unfinished, but Gibson used a nitrocellulose lacquer with time and temperature and humidity the wood would shrink and expand and would cause cracks in the lacquer. And we call that checking on guitars. And so if you look at the finish, of course there's checking in, in what original finish is left, but also what's amazing is that there's almost this ghosting of checking that's burned into the wood on the face of this guitar. I've never seen anything quite like it and I don't think it was really noticeable in the video. It makes it look really unique and to me, I love the old patina, the old wear of a vintage guitar, and it tells a story. This guitar is like a functioning, playing piece of folk art. Uh, I wanna start out with the headstock here. Let's remove the original tuners, take a look at those. Uh, the truss rod cover as well. See if the truss rod is intact and if it still turns. That's gonna be a key component in trying to get this guitar playable again. So let's go ahead and carefully remove the truss rod cover and see the condition of the truss rod nut and perhaps we can try to see if it turns. So as you can see, the original finish underneath the truss rod is actually in pretty decent condition as compared to the rest. The truss rod is not over tightened and the condition of the nut looks like it may never have been turned before. You can use a little truss rod tool like this for Gibson guitars and it turns freely and easily with no problem. So that's a good sign. Let's take a look at the tuners real quick. Now these are the original no-line Cluson tuners as they call them. They have this blank line going through the center and in 1955, this changed to say Cluson Deluxe. That was the company that made these tuners for both Gibson and Fender. And you can see the original tuner buttons have completely disintegrated. I'm gonna order a set and make these whole again so we can use them on the guitar. This shaft is a little bent. We should be able to fix that. So as you can see here on the back, there's a crack from the side of the neck going across and this is a very common break on Gibson guitars because of the neck angle and the nature of mahogany wood it is it's prone to cracking you can actually flex the headstock and see the crack move which is actually a good sign because this means that no one's ever glued it before so I'll be able to get some glue in here and clamp this back together and get that crack to seal up and it'll be good as new I wanna move on to uh, the profile of the neck and the fretboard here. So these look like the original frets to me and they're in pretty good condition overall. I don't think this guitar was actually played a whole lot despite the condition of it, but we'll use these digital calipers here and I'll tell you guys the shape of the neck. It does have a pretty good ding in the fretboard here, but I can probably fix that fairly easily. So the width at the nut 
is 1.65 and the depth at the first fret is 0.93. That's pretty standard for a Les Paul Jr. of this era. And then at the 12th fret, 2.03. Depth at the 12th fret, it's about 0.99. It's a really good, good profile. These 50s necks feel really nice. Moving on, let's take a look at the body. All right, let's remove the original pit guard using these three screws and see what's underneath. Wow. There's the back of the pit guard there. No social security number or uh, any hidden secrets there, but that is a nice original pit guard. Those are hard to find. Underneath, I expected to see a little more paint, to be honest, but this shows you what the original tobacco sunburst would have looked like. On the, on the outside edges, you would have this more black brown burst and this yellow sunburst in the center. Uh, unfortunately, you can see the condition of all this paint. It's really bad. I'm actually just gonna go ahead and put this pig guard back on for now. I don't really see a reason to, to leave that off. I wanna give you guys a good look at this heel repair. I got a lot of comments in the previous video that people were arguing this guitar is not even original Gibson because Gibson guitars did not have bolt-on necks. And they are correct about that. However, this is clearly someone's home job. Um, these are wood screws someone put in there. Those are not supposed to be there. And it's such a bad job, you can see from this angle that the neck is not seated in the neck pocket. It's sitting up about an eighth of an inch or so raised up in the neck pocket, which is making the neck angle really harsh. And that's why in that video, I couldn't do anything but just play slide on it. The intonation was so out of control and the tuning was, was terrible. But what I'm gonna have to do in another episode is remove these screws, hopefully be able to pull the neck out. You can see these horizontal cracks into the body, which are really bad. And we're gonna have to try to get the neck to seat back in the neck pocket and hopefully glue it back in place. I haven't decided yet whether or not I will try to plug these holes or just leave the screws in place. Honestly, it doesn't really bother me. You're not gonna see it very often being on the back of the guitar. And it is kind of part of the guitar's history. So I might just get the neck angle right and leave the screws in place. All right, let's move on to the pots and see if we can date this guitar. Here's the original cover to the control cavity. But inside we have the original pots and the gray tiger capacitor, which is actually not even in the circuit currently. Um, this thing is in rough condition. The good thing is you can see the original pots inside and the original solder joints and also the original sunburst finish in there as well. Uh, I'm gonna try to pull these pots out and see if we can find the date code. All right, so these are the original pots. Oh gosh. And there goes the capacitor, just fell out of place. It shows how fragile some of this stuff has become. You'll notice too that the tone pot was broken off. I was never even able to use it when I played it. It does seem to turn, I believe. So the date on these pots is gonna be here on the side. So this is the moment we've been waiting for. They're 500K pots, which is correct. And here you go. 408, if you look at the side of the pot there, this is a super early Les Paul Jr. I've never seen date codes that early on one, actually. Let's see what this other one is. 423, I believe, if I'm reading that correctly. 500K, oh, that's a 250K perfectly normal for these to be a few weeks apart, especially since they are different values. Now, to be honest, I thought both of these would be 500K on a Gibson. I'm gonna have to research that. They're definitely both original, but that's a 250K tone pot. And then, like I say, this one's dated 
whatever that says. I'll have to get a better look at it. 23rd week, but this is eighth week of 54, both 54 pots. Um, that shows us that this is a 1954 Les Paul Jr., absolutely, with these very early pots. And you can see all the original solder joints on these, original gray tiger, as they call it, tone capacitor. That's that's a really awesome find, man. This is a first year, first year Les Paul Jr. All right, so uh, let's go ahead and get a reading on the original P90, see what it says. Wow, the paint is just crumbling everywhere. I think the pickup cover is probably pretty shrunken and it's it's cracked, you can see on both corners. I'm having a hard time. It's not wanting to come off. So these old plastics, they will shrink and it's probably shrunken in place on this P90 because it's likely probably never been off. But everything looks correct here. But let's go ahead and get a reading on the original pickup. And there we're getting a reading of 7.5. If you guys can see that, hopefully. 7.52. It's probably the most accurate reading on that pickup I've gotten so far. Oh, and then the final component on this guitar, which was interesting. I talked about it in the previous episode. But this is the original wraparound tailpiece to this guitar. And in 1955 and earlier, I think early 55, they used these more shallow bridge posts. And they also had the pickup moved closer to the bridge. You can see there's just a sliver of mahogany here between the route of the, the P90 and that bridge post. And so what happens over time is this will crack and also the bridge post will begin to lean because they were not deep enough into the wood. And if I look at these at an angle, I can really see how they're starting to lean over. That might be something that has to be addressed on this guitar. You can drill them out a little further and put in new bridge posts. Uh, it's probably a worthwhile endeavor. But the original uh, wraparound tailpiece on these guitars, 54 and earlier, they were thinner. So here's a bridge from another junior and you can see uh, this is the original that is thinner. So this later bridge, wraparound bridge, will not even fit on these bridge posts. So I don't know what that does to the guitar, if it affects it in any way. All right, guys, thank you so much for watching this episode on what is indeed a 1954 Gibson Les Paul Jr., the very first year of manufacture for these guitars. Based on the pots, that makes this a very, very early guitar and quite a rare guitar, actually. And uh, with all these unique early features, it's a very, very cool guitar. And what's also interesting, in 1954 was the lowest year of manufacture for these guitars. I think there was maybe like 800 of them made. So to find one in the wild, still in completely original, untouched condition, it's hard to believe to me that 70 years later with the internet, with people knowing the value of these instruments, that you would still find them at all. But in original condition, just you know, sitting in the garage or sitting in the barn for, for decades on end, uh, to me, it's, it's really remarkable to find one of those 800 guitars. I mean, how many have been you know, lost or stolen or in a fire or in a flood like this one may have actually been um, or how many were refinished or routed or chopped up. Um, it's, it's really, really remarkable. I think in one of the next episodes, we're gonna have to fix the headstock crack as well as this neck heel. So we might pull the neck in another episode. So we'll, we'll remove the neck, maybe get some glue in the headstock if we can, glue the neck heel back together, decide what to do on the screws. Um, these are the original frets and you know, they don't, they never played very well. They're very small. If this guitar was an original clean example, I, I might just leave those be, but I think it's it's safe to uh, you know go ahead and put in some nice playable frets because I really want to play this guitar. Uh, I got to order some parts, so I'm going to need these new tuner buttons for the original tuners. I want to salvage these. They turn really good and they're original to the guitar, so I want to save those. Um, I'm gonna have to 
see if I can weld a new shaft on this tone pot. I would really like to keep it original to the guitar and the fact that it was 500 and 250K. Again, I'm not 100% sure if that was standard for Gibson, but I, I wanna know how that sounds. Um, and I also need a couple of knobs for this guitar. This would have come with the 50 style gold Les Paul knob. So I gotta find a couple of those to make those accurate. I think I might just rock with the original bridge for now. I think that's pretty much everything, unless we do something about the finish. I think most people who watch this channel know the way I feel about guitar finishes and what I will ultimately end up doing, but you guys drop a comment. Let, let me know in the comment section if you would refinish it, if you would clear it, what you wanna do. But the problem with clearing it is that it's going to change the look of the wood and of the patina, and there's no guarantee that spraying over this paint is gonna hold it in place unless you apply it very thick. Um, a lot of this flaking has, has already separated from the wood, so just encapsulating it, it's gonna take a good amount of clear coat to do that. Um, my good friend Joel Wilkins, who's to me the greatest guitar luthier of all time, he said one thing I could try is using what's called a blush remover, which is, I guess, sort of a low-grade lacquer thinner and it's, it's used to spray over a blushy area in a new paint job. And what it does is it remelts the lacquer and gets rid of that look. But it's not aggressive as a lacquer thinner, so I might be able to spray it on here and it could remelt the lacquer and secure it to the wood again. And I wouldn't have to spray any clear over, over anything, which is like I say, it's gonna change the look of, of the patina of the finish that's original and also the wood around it. I think in one episode, we might do some, some testing on trying to preserve the original finish, but I gotta get this video edited and out to you guys in a timely fashion. So stay tuned, subscribe for the next few episodes. We'll get this guitar running and uh, I'm gonna get out there and play it for you guys. All right, see you guys later. Peace.